All right, it's 201. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Sean Conrad with the Sustainable Development Team here at NCT COG. Welcome to our July 2022 meeting of the Coordinated Land Use and Transportation Planning Task Force. Thank you all for joining us again. We really appreciate your continued participation. We developed a task force to provide a forum for North Texas local governments to discuss best practices related to coordinating land use and transportation plans, policies, and progress. So we hope you enjoy today's discussion. We're recording this meeting and the recording will be posted on the website along with the presentation slides. And we will, as usual, send out a follow up email um, letting you know that those are posted. If you have any questions or comments at any time, please feel free to enter those into the chat box. We'll also have a few minutes after each presentation to take any questions related to that presentation. And then we'll also have uh, time for any other questions or thought you'd like to share during our panel discussion after all the presentations are completed. Uh, next slide, please. And let's continue. So today's meeting is the third of our 2022 task force meetings. We have one more meeting scheduled for October 21st, and then we'll continue to meet quarterly in 2023, and our full schedule is posted on the website there. Next slide, please. So to start today, we'll have some local updates from NCT COG and the city of Carrollton, and then we'll move into presentations touching on our theme today, which is expanded and walkable North Texas. And we'll have presentations from Little Elm, Terrell, and the City of Dallas. Uh, we'll wrap up with a panel discussion and announcements, uh, including a discussion of our transportation alternatives call for projects, which just opened on Monday. Uh, so we hope you'll stick around for that if you're interested in funding for bicycle, pedestrian infrastructure, uh, safe routes to school, or safety projects. Next slide, please. Okay, let's take a real quick look, look at our results of our introductory poll. Looks like we have 100% city government today. So that is uh, very interesting. Thank you, everybody. Um, we have also placed a link, or we will be shortly placing a link into the, the chat survey, the chat box for our meeting evaluation survey. Uh, please feel free to fill that out at any time during or after the meeting. We really value your input, so we hope that you'll complete that. Um, and we'll have that uh, insert that into the chat later on as well. Okay, let's start the local updates. So uh, I am going to actually start this out. I'm going to give you a quick update on the Fort Worth to Dallas Regional Trail Branding and Wayfinding Project that we have underway. I'll be going through this pretty quickly in the interest of time, but if you would like more information, I am entering the project website into the chat box here, and there's a wealth of information there. All right, next slide, please. So um, the Fort Worth to Dallas Regional Trail, some may be familiar with this project. Um, this, this trail uh, will be a completion and more than 50 mile multi-use paved trail spanning the five cities of Fort Worth, Arlington, Grand Prairie, Irving, and Dallas. So it's roughly connecting downtown Fort Worth to downtown Dallas. There will be, uh, currently we have uh, more than 50 miles of trail existing and open, being used every day. There is another 12 and a half miles approximately of trail under construction. Um, that construction, the entire trail is expected to be complete at the end of 2020 to early 2024. Um, the overall goals of this trail are multiple um, transportation use uh, for getting to destinations, recreation, and events, large, small, and exploration uses, so just being able to explore the region. Um, it's also envisioned as a regional, state, and national attraction for events and tourism. Like me. Um, this is the trail map uh, showing you the uh, approximate alignment of the trail, again, going from roughly downtown Fort Worth to downtown Dallas. And <clears throat> excuse me, if you would like more detailed maps, more detailed information, again, on our website, there is a whole ton of information um, on the status of the various segments of the trail if you'd like to look at those maps online. The trail branding uh, project goals, it's, it's a fairly wide ranging project. 
uh, we are creating a unified name, brand, and signage package um, with co-branding of the local trails. So we wanted to make sure we, that we incorporate the existing trails and branding, trail names and branding that occur already along the trail through the city. Um, the re we're, gonna, we're developing recommendations for infrastructure to hold major regional and national events, such as an Ironman event or a major marathon, uh, other types of events. We are developing recommendations for integrating a 911 signage system and lighting recommendations. We're developing recommendations for electronic message boards and real-time display trail counters, and also building consensus for ongoing marketing and operations of the trail to ensure its success uh, going into the future. Next slide, please. We have had uh, quite a bit of stakeholder and public engagement already. Hopefully some of you have seen um, some of these announcements. We've had uh, some stakeholder meetings to, to solicit feedback on um, the naming and branding process that would, that's informing the name and brand development. We held a virtual open house uh, in late 2021, where we asked about um, people's visual preferences and their general preferences for themes they'd like to see, current trail use, and that also helped to inform the branding process. Um, the, we also held a public forum, excuse me, uh, earlier this year, um, and the main purpose of that was to receive votes uh, from the public on two trail name and logo combination options uh, to ultimately arrive at the final name and logo for the project that would also be incorporated into the wayfinding signage and, and the branding. We had some goals for guiding the name and local development um, that uh, we're looking for something that is recognizable that would provide cues uh, as to the location of the trail for people who live outside the region. And this really gets to wanting to have this be a uh, not only local but also and regional, but also state and national destinations. We wanted it to be easy, easily referenced to a broad spectrum of people, easy to understand and interpret, welcoming for all types of trail users, bicycle, pedestrian, other types of non-motorized transportation. Encompassing, we didn't want it to uh, be limited to a particular city name because this, we could have could have future expansion of this trail, and also supported by the broad values and themes that we've identified through the public feedback that we felt. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right, so getting to the meat of the matter here with the public feedback forum. Uh, we presented two uh, name and logo options to the public uh, to vote on. One was our option one, the DFW Discovery Trail, um, and it had the logo option that you see here that highlights flora and fauna that you might see on the trail. Um, kind of cool thing about this is that uh, individual cities could have uh, a different animal, a different color for each of their trail segments or their trails going through their city. Um, and this would also allow for co-branding on the logo. And then we also had another option, number two, which is a DFW Trinity Trail. And this uh, logo had a more of a dominant, uh, highlighted the Trinity River as being a really dominant feature of the trail and it builds in kind of the water and land elements and has a very memorable design. So we have these two options available. We had uh, more than 2,600 people uh, vote. And I'm going to announce to you the winner. So drum roll, please. And next slide. All right, winning name and logo was DFW Discovery Trail. We have our new name for our, what was formerly called the Forward to Dallas Regional Trail. Um, and you can see here, these are preliminary logo concepts. So the finalized logo is su subject to some tweaking and change as we work uh, with the cities to finalize the design. Um, but this gives you the, you know, pretty much the, the, um, the gist of it. Um, we could have different color options. Again, we might have different animals. So these are just some examples of what some of those might look like. All right, so thank you for to any of you who participated in this. We really appreciate that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just some feedback we got in the, uh, open, in the open house as well on possible destinations to include in our wayfinding signage. Next slide, please. Uh, up to, upcoming activities, we're going to be refining the logo. We'll be developing our recommendations, additional steering committee meetings, and then promoting the final name and branding recommendations. We'll be 
completing the project in late fall 2022. Next slide, please. All right, more information. You've got the website in the chat. Next slide. And here are our contacts. So thank you everybody uh, for allowing me to present that update. I think we're going to move on now to our second update, which we have uh, Josh Giles from the city of Carrollton. And this project was, um, uh, this was a uh, project that was uh, presented also at our January meeting. So Josh is going to give us an update. It's been in the work for a number of years and has now started construction. So take it away, Josh. It sure has, yes. Uh, thank you, Sean, Travis, Catherine, everybody for getting me on today. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all and share uh, some of the exciting news coming out of uh, Carrollton's Trinity Mill Station. Um, slide, please. Um, this has been a, a coordinated effort here to redevelop um, the 35 and George Bush intersection in Carrollton. Slide, please. Yeah, I think we're going to zoom past the video here. Uh, Yes, so uh, the, the area in red here is city owned property, uh, area in blue is DART property, and this is a, a three way partnership between our two entities and our development partners. Um, so really exciting that uh, we came together with, with DART to partner on this TOD uh, redevelopment effort. The area in red took 10 years to assemble on the city side, uh, a lot of purchases of um, one off businesses and uses that weren't compatible with our vision. Um, and then DART's been a great partner in uh, the land that they own and repurposing uh, the area there on the east, uh, moving their, their fleet services out so it can be part of the vision. Uh, this goes directly to um, downtown Denton. If you go further north on the A train or all the way down uh, to downtown Dallas. And one stop to the south is our downtown Carrollton station, which will have future access to the Silver Line, uh, getting riders to downtown Plano. Uh, at one end and uh, DFW Airport on the other. Slide, please. <clears throat> Here is our master plan, and uh, we're under construction and on our way. So uh, everything in phase 1A um, on the city side, the public infrastructure side, is under construction and, and due to be substantially complete um, here next month. So that's a, a three acre esplanade in the middle, and that's the heartbeat of the project. Um, that will really create some great public spaces there, and we'll get into how that's programmed here in just a second. Um, and then you can see here we've got uh, office towers planned on the northern end of the first phase uh, with structured parking, and then a mixed use uh, residential building there on the south. Slide, please. So the Esplanade will feature some interactive berms. And that's the area that's closest to access uh, to the DART uh, station. And so um, we've got you know, a lot envisioned there with uh, families being able to hang out, um, you know, wait for their table at a restaurant, linger after dinner, things like that. The event lawn can be programmed a variety of ways. So we envision um, a lot of great concepts coming in, concerts, outdoor movies, yoga in the park, all those good things. Um, and then this all fronts um, you know, retail at grade uh, for our office and mixed use buildings. And so this will really be activated and lively from a pedestrian perspective. Slide. If you are familiar with our downtown, uh, this is an overlay here of our historic square. And so you can see how the Esplanade will be much larger of a green space. Um, and so we envision kind of a next level um, of, of public events being offered here at Trinity Mill Station. Slide. <clears throat> Here's an aerial shot uh, of, of our vision here, and as you can see in phase two, um, the office towers are projected to be um, even taller, uh, include some more mixed-use multifamily, um, and then a hotel component, as well as entertainment and venues um, for to draw uh, folks in that way. Slide. Here's a sectional here of how uh, our developments thought through. And one of the things we're most excited about is uh, the buildings uh, that, that have retail and live work at grade. They're really set back far. And so there's ample room for um, patio space and for, um, you know, really a pedestrian ease 
between uh, the, the automobile traffic and you've got tree wells and planters in between and then just ample room for for sidewalk dining. So this should read as a very comfortable space um, from a pedestrian level. Uh, and also it's being designed with uh, hand laid brick pavers and uh, there's a curbless uh, street system in place with center drains. So uh, that adds for a, uh, a really nice experience from a pedestrian level that everything is uh, at the same grade. Slide. So cruising right along, um, we had a, a fountain uh, proposal uh, about a year and a half ago, and our city council just basically hit the big pause button. We said, wait a second, I think we can do better here. I think we can create something that's really special. Uh, since this is a catalytic project, uh, this is like a, a diamond pendant on a necklace. We wanted to make sure we really got it right. So our council um, went back out to the drawing board um, and hired a, an excellent uh, design firm out of uh, Southern California called Outside the Lines, and they were able to create um, a really special and engaging uh, water feature here. Uh, slide, please. We can see some renderings. So this is a set of 12 uh, railroad semaphores, uh, which is the kind of old school signaling arms. Uh, I think that's actually still used today in some places uh, for, for trains. And so these will be interactive. They'll be moving um, constantly in these very um, you know elaborate water shows and uh, they'll they'll be semi transparent and colored so they'll be letting the light through and so we're just really excited that um, this will be um, visible not only from the pedestrian level and from uh, you know some of the second third fourth floors of our buildings but also from the the highways uh, from 35 flyover onto george bush um, this is proposed to be between i think 12 and 16 feet so it will really create uh, a substantial presence uh, even from far away. Next slide. So here's a quick look at uh, where we're at now. So uh, or a few months ago rather and um, made a lot of progress there. We just uh, got trees in uh, yesterday and so everything is really coming together. Um, but as you can see here a lot uh, a lot has gone on in the past year to create this site and um, give ourselves a, a great start at Trinity Mill Station. Slide, please. This will interact with our regional uh, trail systems. And so um, we're real excited about that. So will our downtown station. Um, and so you can see there's a, a proposed uh, linkage there that follows roughly along I-35 on the eastern side. And um, we want this project to be, you know, a home not only for you know pedestrians and, and folks who are getting there by car and by rail, but also for our cyclists. And so um, it's really exciting that uh, we're going to be able to tap right in uh, to the great planning that's gone on uh, for the hike and bike trails. And so um, now if you could just cruise through these next slides, maybe 10 seconds a slide, and we'll show you all some renderings here. Um, this is the phase one office rendering, uh, six stories, 125,000 square feet, class A office. This is the first and tallest class A office in Carrollton, so we're really redefining what Carrollton offers to uh, corporate America and some of these larger tenants. So um, this is really a chance for us to redefine and elevate um, how Carrollton is seen in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. We're very excited about that. Um, the um, contractor that we're using, Joris Engineering, Kimley Horn. Um, we've got Venture Commercial leasing out the ground floor retail and JLL working on the office space. So really a dynamo team here uh, along with our development partners COA out of Irving and Integral uh, out of Atlanta. So it's a it's been a great pleasure to work with all of them as this comes together. This is some shots here of our mixed use multifamily that will be started soon and all at grade retail or live work units or restaurant space. Um, so we're just really excited about how engaging this will be from a pedestrian perspective and some of the future office renderings here. Um, show again the possibilities of us uh, reaching even higher uh, with our density and um, really creating a place like nowhere else. So um, with that I being our last slide, thank you all so much uh, for the time today to update y'all. Feel free to drive by uh, and you can check in and uh, George would be happy to show you guys around. You can just peek in and stay in your air conditioning, but uh, we welcome you up um, here shortly as the Esplanade opens and uh, stay tuned.
a lot of exciting things going on. I think so. Thank you very much, Josh. I, I think we're next going to move into our main theme and presentations for this uh, meeting, expanding walkable places in North Texas. And Travis Liska with our sustainable development team is going to uh, lead that and also provide an introduction to this topic. Good on. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, and thank you, Josh. That was a great update on that uh, project in, in Carrollton. Lots of cool stuff uh, to see there. Uh, so yeah, as Sean said, I'm Travis Liska, principal planner here, and I'll be leading us through our main uh, topic discussion this afternoon. We're really lucky to have uh, three municipalities also join us for this topic, uh, Little Elm, uh, Terrell, and Dallas, talking about what they're doing in their communities to expand walkable places in North Texas. Uh, you know, we think this is an important part of our transportation system to uh, have walkable places where people have that choice of taking different modes of transportation. And our goal for this discussion is to kind of share how that's happening uh, in different cities. And I'll kick us off with an intro uh, into sort of the benefits and uh, some data we've put together on documenting uh, walkable places in the region. So, so why are we having this conversation? Well, it's important to the greater North Texas region that we give people choices in transportation options other than maybe the car that that helped them get around to different access different places. Uh, because as you know, the region's growing rapidly. Uh, and so we, we've got to kind of diversify our transportation options and have the have Brazilian options that give people choices and help our system. You know, walkable places also uh, provide a lot of fiscal benefit to cities, uh, creating vibrant uh, places that uh, uh, private sector will invest in. And, you know, it's a healthy option for residents to get more walking into their daily activities. So a lot of benefits there. And we think this is a growing trend in North Texas, as we'll discuss on a future slide. Uh, but if we go into some background on our next slide, the NCTCOG has been supporting the development of walkable places and their importance to our region for quite some time now. Uh, we had a brochure about a decade ago uh, promoting, promoting walkable streets. Uh, and then more recently, we worked with folks from George Washington University really documenting the, the economic benefit of, of these walkable places, our, our dense uh, places that are generating a lot of activity for North Texas. That report is on our website as well. We've also throughout the years uh, funded catalytic projects in a lot of walkable districts throughout North Texas. I'm sure many of you represent municipalities where NCTCOG has assisted with some of these. And also fairly recently, you know, walkable buildings at, TO, at transit stations, transit-oriented developments, We've been documenting those and sort of providing some uh, benchmarking of good practices there, and that's also available on our website. So we were going to continue that support for walkable places, and today's discussion is, is an important part of that. Um, but first, not just why walkable places, but exactly what are walkable places. And uh, we really want to focus on defining them as places designed for walkability. So on the private side are the buildings, are, are the orientation of those structures sort of facilitating that walking, those walking trips. It, you have some density. And uh, on that land use side, you have a good mix of uses that's gonna allow residents to take more walking trips because uh, it's not just the commute that matters. We have a lot of trips in our region that come from other purposes. And so it's important to have that connection. Uh, and of course, uh, really looking at the transportation context uh, is, is really significant. So we're really, again, focused on that design aspect, not just are people walking because they have to or because they're super motivated, but have we in the public sector created spaces that make that convenient and safe? So on our next slide, I think we're gonna take a quick break to get a poll uh, question from everyone. And I think we're gonna be able to drop this uh, link here in the chat. OK, there it is. Yeah, so you can also use your phone, scan the QR code if you if you want to do that. Uh, but basically, uh, for the community you represent, what's uh, your relationship to walkable places? Um, 
are you a place that has some walkable um, areas, but maybe not much expansions happening? Maybe you have them and yes, you're trying to have more walkable places or expand them. Uh, maybe your community that doesn't have them yet, but you're planning on developing one or something's in progress. Or of course, if you're a place that doesn't have them and there's nothing on the near term, that's cool too. Uh, we're happy you're here to uh, join us for the conversation, but if you'll um, let us know where you're at, that will help our speakers and everyone kind of get a feel for who's listening. All right, so thank you, Catherine, for putting those results up. Looks like most of the folks on this call who responded said they do have a walkable place, and yes, they're interested in expanding that place. Awesome, that is great to see. And if we go back to the slides, that jives really well with the information we've put together and sort of the look at mapping out walkable places. So I'm gonna show you a map here in a minute uh, that is the result of NCT COG staff doing some GIS work, really trying to look at the scale and scope of where walkable places are in the region. We're doing this because we do wanna do a little bit of data analysis on it, but also we wanna promote the development of these places. We want to provide best practices and you know encourage the public to see the benefit of them as well. Uh, and so to do this, it was you know uh, using the uh, George Washington University walk up, wake up places to start. Uh, then we use some uh, data that COG has and that is publicly available to sort of refine and identify more places. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, COG staff kind of did a lot of interpretation uh, of uh, different areas to kind of identify those. Again, really focused on design. And we are going to give you all the option to provide some feedback on these places. And that'll also be in a future uh, link at the end of the slides. So uh, the next slide, I think, just kind of goes through a lot of the design factors you know, related to our definition. We're really interested in the building form, the orientation, the density. Does it support pedestrians? Um, the mix of uses, as I mentioned with the definition, you know, we're really uh, focused on commercial cores, but we want to see can some form of residential access reach that that commercial area. And then, of course, do you have the sidewalks, the safe street design, um, the lighting, the crossings in place that make that happen? So those are some of the factors we looked at uh, when we map these places out. And I think our next slide looks at uh, this is the 2019 walk up, wake up results. So this was us working with uh, the folks at George Washington University, and they use some national criteria. Because uh, if you follow the walk up, wake up report, they've been doing this uh, in different regions across the country. And so 77 places were sort of what we settled on at that that point. And uh, I've got the report that's on our website linked there. If anyone wants to investigate that, we'll of course share these slides after the fact. But let's go to the next slide where you can see um, what we came up with uh, as COG staff here. 143 places. Um, so this is meant to be much more inclusive of smaller communities and every community in our 12 counties. We're really looking at those historic main streets and downtowns drove a lot of uh, identifying those places. And um, of course, we are open to feedback on this. Um, you know, we, there's a chance we didn't catch everything. So we would definitely like for you guys to review the layer we're going to share and uh, send us some comments if you think something needs to be added or are modified. And with that data, we did a year of establishment. So we looked at places that were you know, historically existing because they have that um, sort of 19th century or early 20th century establishments um, kind of prior to the automobile. Uh, versus we've had a what we think is a significant wave of new places in the last 20 years uh, that have this walkable design. And, and so, of course, on our call today, you're going to hear from community like Little Elm. That's part of this really new uh, wave of walkable places. And of course, you'll also hear from Terrell, a community that has this historic core of it. They're continuing to improve. And Dallas is, is a little bit of both where the project they'll be speaking about today is relatively new, but certainly represents uh, quite a few historically walkable places in there and uh, also expanding as part of this ongoing orientation to walkability. So I'll then conclude here my, my portion of this intro um, by again inviting you to comment on those walkable places if you feel inclined. Uh, we'll be emailing this link out after the meeting, so you don't have to worry about this right now. 
And of course, uh, this is just a draft initial effort of uh, identifying these places. We're going to add a little more context data and indicators to uh, those places as well as we go forward after we get your feedback. And ultimately, we'd like to use this again, something that's public facing to really promote the places, really build support for them and to really possibly look at best practices. So. Uh, overall, I think this is a, an important trend in our region where we're seeing a lot of walkability. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've got three communities here to talk about how they are, uh, you know, increasing that walkability and taking those places to the next level. Uh, so if you have questions for me in the interest of time on this, uh, you can put them in the chat and I'll, I'll address them sort of at the end of our, our panel conversation. Or, of course, feel free to email us after the fact. We're always open to that. So now I'm going to uh, see if our folks from Little Elm are ready to share the story of the Lakefront District, because I know that's a great project that they've been working on up there. So Jeanette, Fred, if y'all are ready, go for it. Yes, sir. Um, nice to meet y'all. Look forward to the opportunity to speaking with you today. Uh, I'm Jeanette Espinosa, the Executive Director for Little Elm Economic Development. And I'm Fred Gibbs. I'm the director of development services uh, for the town of Little Elm. And I just literally met Jeanette yesterday, so this is the first time <laughs> we're doing this. So, <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> so, into the walkability development, and that's so true. Uh, it's taken us about 13 years to through the acquisition process to pick up all of the land that we currently own. So this is at Main Street in El Dorado, down in the heart of what we call the lakefront development. And the EDC owns the majority of the land with the town having some intermittent parcels throughout it. Um, it. We've done it in several phases and we've been very deliberate in the users that we've gone after. And as we proceed through this uh, PowerPoint, you'll see those specifically. But what we've done, I mean, back in the 60s when they expanded Lake Dallas and blew the dam, um, our original downtown was flooded and we truly haven't had a downtown for since that time. So we were tasked with basically going in and, and purchasing land and demoing, you know, everything from um, several churches to the original school here in Little Elm, as well as some old restaurants and homes that have been redeveloped. And we've been very blessed in that we've done that with little or no controversy. Um, I think the biggest selling point for us was to be able to communicate throughout that process with the churches and the school district and the other users that we purchased land from to make sure that we got buy-in from them for the overall development, what our vision was and what the end product would be. So you'll see this is kind of the layout. The town owns this back here, which is our rec center and our water park. And then we've incorporated uh, multifamily with retail as well as entertainment and hotels. Next slide, please. So the the part I want to talk about a little bit is, you know, obviously when you when you get into um, you know, walkability and downtown districts, you know, is really getting introduced a you know a, a residential component and a multifamily component, and you know that was one thing. Obviously, we had to get everybody on board with um, introducing this type of you know residential use to to create the synergy and the energy in the area to support you know, a walkable um, area that has connectivity between businesses, you know, destinations and whatnot. So, you know, one thing that we were very intentional was, was, okay, we need to partner up with a developer to basically create that residential component. Um, this here is what's known as the district. It's basically Palladium phase two. Uh, we have another phase that is basically just due south of this particular picture you're looking at, you know, right this, this one has, you know, 324 units, two story uh, building has a wrap parking garage and sky bridge. And within it, it has some, uh, you know, some retail and some loft apartments uh, above. It's a little bit of vertical mixed use that kind of borders um, along our main street area. So, you know, this is the snapshot of how this is integrated within the area. And, you know, just right behind it, obviously, is your traditional uh, suburban single family. But, you have to create these environments, we felt, to create that walkability and that connectivity between um, the residential component and some of these commercial uses. And we'll kind of talk a little bit, some um, public entities that actually ties into this as well. So next slide. 
And one other thing on the multifamily, we actually sold them that land mm -hmm. because once we got to the finish line, um, in order to make the ROI be there and to make the, the numbers work, it wasn't an option for a ground lease because it just skewed their numbers and the, they used HUD funding for the project and it was more difficult to get a lease purchase done through HUD than it was if they actually owned the land. Um, one of the things that we had to do in order to sell them the land, as opposed to having to go out for bid, um, we formed a Little Elm Local Development Corporation, which was an extension of the town. And we deeded the land over to the Local Development Corporation, and then they handled the transaction with the developer, the private entity, in order to uh, sell them the land and then transfer the money back to the EDC via the town. Next slide. So this is our first entertainment venue and on the original side, you saw it's right on the hard corner of Maine and El Dorado. The EDC actually owns this land and actually built the building. Um, we will be handing the keys over to the tenant uh, actually tomorrow. So it's a big oh. day for us. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, an entertainment venue that's the first of its kind in our community. We've been very deliberate on, on the users that we've gone after because in order for us to be competitive with our surrounding communities, we had to find something different that wasn't on every corner so that people would be interested enough to drive into the community and experience what we're putting there. It'll, it houses everything from bowling, bocce ball, cornhole, axe throwing, ping pong, a redemption arcade, shuffleboard, a full service restaurant and bar, uh, fire pits and in both indoor and outdoor components of that venue. We're super excited about it. So in what we did, we actually viewed, went and viewed probably six different venues that we liked and then picked and pulled the components of it that we felt best fit our residents and our community and then went out and found a user to occupy the building once we, we came up with the design. Next slide. Yeah, so, you know, obviously all this thing, you know, Jeanette touched on a little bit, but, you know, there's been a ton of, you know, private public partnerships, you know, of getting all these these different components, you know, done. And I, you know, I think that's super important, you know, in order to be partners to create this, because God knows it's just very difficult for one entity to provide all these different types of uh, amenities and destinations. And so, you know, the town also made a commitment of, Hey, you know what? What can we do? You know what? What element can we integrate into this um, mixed use development? And so we came up with a concept here that's actually currently, I think, out for bid as we speak, um, called the Lawn at Lakefront. It's it. We envision it kind of like a mini Clyde Warren Park um, that's just very create a nice gathering place for um, not only for that area but for the community. Uh, it's going to have a a little performance pavilion, playground. Um, you know, we have a historic water tower that's also on this uh, property that is kind of one of those iconic uh, things for Little Elm. Uh, some 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 land, uh, uh, lawn games, a nice buffer. So, you know, truly just a, another area of gathering for events, um, creating that that place where people can just you know go to the Tin Man, come here, hang out, provide you know have an entire afternoon experience here. Um, with everybody's family. So uh, again, it's just basically it has that connectivity. Uh, we were going to program some food trucks in this area, uh, just a lot of passive gathering places and whatnot. So um, super cool um, concept that we are kind of putting out there right now. Next slide. Uh, right behind the entertainment venue is our first hotel, uh, La Quinta del Sol by Wyndham. And we are actually, uh, EDC owns that property, but once they obtain their CO, we'll be actually deeding the property over to the developer. In exchange for that, we were able to be very specific about some of the finish out elements of the hotel. One of those being that it must have a rooftop patio and uh, full, uh, a bar and as well as a restaurant but it was important that we have patio views from both sides of the hotel because you can actually see the lake from both sides because of the way it's built on one of the peninsulas. Um, the lake is one of our, you know, a definite 
attributes that we use as a draw for tourism and everything that we've designed, we've done so with either rooftop or top floor patios and bars so that we make sure that we're capturing those views and, and amenities that are available to us that make up us a little different from the surrounding communities. Uh, it should open sometime late October, November-ish, if all things go accordingly. Next slide, please. So, you know, another project to show the town's commitment to this area and the investment into it when it comes to, you know, for the residents and, and destination. We, we've, I guess we've been open the Cove a little over a year now, almost a year and a half, I guess a year and a half. Um, the Cove, basically, it's our, you know, 42,000 square foot uh, indoor water park. Um, these are some really cool pictures in it. If you haven't been there, I would invite you up to look at it. Um, you know, it's got a flow rider, a lot of indoor cool things for the for the kids and for the adults as well. But um, again, you know, this is another one of those type of projects that the town felt that we needed to do to create that energy to bring people into our lakefront district. You know, we have a very seasonal population just due to the fact of the proximity to the lake. So, you know, we had to put our heads together and come up with some other, you know, element to have that draw all year round right so you know what perfect draw is besides a water park it meshes in with our culture our values here at the town than a uh, than a water park so um, this has helped you know with that full service that full seasonal um, element for the town to to create that keep that energy going throughout the year instead of the uh, spring summertime type of um, type of seasons that we have but um, Fred, but yeah, would, Fred, if you would also touch yeah. on the most recent purchase that we made that will allow for the next phase of the water park. Yeah, absolutely. You know, directly behind here, you know, we used to, there is just an, an older home, uh, not an old big mansion for that matter, that absolutely has, you know, awesome lakefront uh, views. I mean, it's literally right on the lake. And we're currently looking at some concepts of expanding this to more of an outdoor experience and some event center. Um, type of uh, facilities with a um, with a hopefully a ho uh, end user being a hotel in that area. So again, you know, it's really just kind of creating the multitude of uses here to you know to have people come into the area to to stay and to hang out for a weekend or whatnot. Um, and us being proximity to the PGA that's coming in and you know very soon that just kind of helps you know brand that even more. So. Uh, really excited for a, a, maybe a potential extension of the Cove's footprint. Next slide. Um, we mentioned that we've been very deliberate after the users that we've gone after. Um, one of the very first catalysts uh, that we went after was Hydra's Wakeboard Park. There was one in Allen and then we recruited them to do a second one here. And to give you an idea as to what we went through in order to do it is originally Beard Park set on the land um, where the restaurant is. We picked it up, boxed it up into Connex boxes, bought additional land to the east and relocate, redesigned and relocated the Beard Park to that property so that we would have enough land to build the ponds for the Hydra's Wakeboard System, which is basically a cable system that enables you to wakeboard behind a pulley, and it can pull up to five people at a time. Um, again, we're seasonal, but on during off-season, uh, most of the riders will ride, wear wetsuits. Some are braver than most, but and then right beside it was Tap House, which is the restaurant component, same owner that went in and built uh, after the Hydra's Wakeboard Park was open. So basically you can sit out on the patio or if you're sitting indoors, the, the garage doors roll up and you can watch the riders as they experience the, the wakeboarding. And then right beside it, we've got Hula Hut. If you've never experienced Hula Hut, the original one was in Austin. We're the second location. Both of actually all three of these concepts were recruited by cold calls. Uh, we put a proposal together, reached out to the owners and basically said, you know, come come look at Little Elm. And at the time we did that, um, almost 11 years ago is when we started that process. There was nothing but a pasture on the property that you see now where this development is and getting them out on site and, and you know, trying to sell that vision 
and get their buy-in to what we were trying to create um, was a little harder than it is now. I will say that phase two and phase three have been considerably easier on recruitment because now, you know, everything's coming out of the ground and you can physically see it. 11 years ago when we started this, that wasn't the case. So it's been a dream that is, um, we've been trying to make a reality now for over a decade. Next slide, please. Yeah, Jeanette talk about cold calls. Now, Jeanette is like, she's like the cold call queen, let me tell you. And if, if there's something on the side of the road that looks interesting, she's going to pull over and check it out. So this one is all her. You know, they, I think she tells a story much more eloquent than I can. But, you know, basically her and her husband was out traveling and they found a place that looked pretty cool. You know, it's called 575 Pizza. So and Jeanette and her fashion went in there. Ate the pizza, it was super good, fresh ingredients, you know, all homemade stuff. And, you know, basically went in and recruited these folks to come to uh, this facility you're looking at right now. Um, you know, one thing that Little Elm has been very, you know, adamant about is, is bringing businesses that are unique in nature. You know, by all means, we welcome, you know, any any business that wants to come in. But in our lakefront, we wanted to have these special places that people want to come and visit, you know. And, and with that, you know, sometimes you have to wait a little while. Sometimes you have to make those cold calls and those special stops to get them folks in here. And 575 Pizza is one of those particular uh, places that we've – that just been part of that, just like the Hula Hut, just like the Hydras and whatnot, and another project that Jeanette will talk about. You know, these are just some of the things that as we wanted little of them to be unique in nature, to just not have the uh, the the norm business there, but you know something that maybe other folks haven't experienced outside of um, the Metroplex. So uh, this is a cool concept. Of this one's what you think this is September, Jeanette? September. Is this yeah, it should be up in September. And you know, and and I kind of wanted to add something too. You know, we talked a little bit about the development of it, um, but you know. We talk about the walkability. All these things is walkable. Another thing that we've been able to support in that walkable initiative is we we have you know basically some elements of some form based codes that allows these buildings to be pushed to the front to have those uh, more green open spaces internally to create that walkable environment. So um, you may have noticed that on on the site plan on the first slide that Jeanette brought up. But um, again, when this is up and running, please come and check it out. It's super cool. Well, and I'd just like to add that. Um, what we do, we are very, very eager in our cold calls, but none of it could be possible if it weren't for the relationship that the EDC has with the development services in the town and the town. Because if you don't work cohesively together, it doesn't matter who you recruit, where from or when, because if if everybody doesn't buy into the same vision and overcome all the hurdles and Fred, I'll ask you to elaborate, you know, with Hula Hut, all that we had to overcome in order for that project to happen. And same with this. Yeah, no, totally. You know, you have to be, you have to have a good team. I, I, I'm very blessed to work with a good team and have a team that works for me. Um, certainly couldn't do it without both Jeanette and her folks and, and the people that work in development services. But you're exactly right. I mean, you have to be flexible. You have to be able to pivot when things pop up and not everything all the time can be cookie cutter uh, black and white and and in the biggest thing honestly is having the political backing as well you know having the support of the council the town manager everybody that that you have this vision and this is where we're working towards and little elm is very fortunate to have all those things uh happening at the same time um uh, which, which is which is very awesome in, in the in municipal government. So <laughs> so we are very blessed to have that. Um, so as, as Jeanette said, you know, Hula had a lot of challenges with the core uh, drainage, you know, and a lot of other things, and just just trying to get these businesses timing and and being flexible, working with with everybody to get them done at the end of the day. Yeah. So you know, Fred talked about the core. While the lake is definitely our asset. Uh, it also sometimes creates some of the the hardest challenges to overcome because the our lake is truly not primarily for recreational. It's, it's for water control and it's not a constant level lake. So we have to deal with that. During the construction of Hula Hut and Hydras, um, the pond behind the Hula Hut and the pond that was for the wakeboarding uh, during the floods back in what, Fred, 2000. Uh, 15, 
15. Yes. Um, it all became one body of water during the midst of the construction, all of it. So to say that, you know, we, we had to overcome those physical hurdles and then we can't build, um, our floodplain is 537 feet and we can't build below that. We can't, you know, we have to adjust for anything that's cut with fill. So there's a lot of challenges that we overcame and it was working, you know, with TxDOT for the alignment around along El Dorado for a connector road and then the core with the flood easement. And then just development in general during a, a year that was extremely heavy in rain, trying to reach deadlines and, and being adaptable to make sure that happened. Next slide, please. Uh, one of our most recent cold calls in the lakefront, right on a hard corner, um, Hurtado's Barbecue, originally in Arlington, I, we're their second location, uh, is just another example that we brought in that is going to be, they opened about a month ago. And the draw that they've brought from the surrounding area because of their following, because of their barbecue has just been unprecedented as to the number of people that it's brought into the lakefront. So it's been um, a great success for us. And if you would go back to the very first slide, and Fred and I'll elaborate just a little bit more on the layout. Two more. There you yeah, go. So that gives you an overview of everything that we have. Um, as I mentioned, EDC owns about 22 acres of the development and the town owns the rest. It's also in a TERS, a tax reinvestment zone uh, that encompasses all of this area as well as some other area to the west, uh, all the way down to our uh, main uh, beach area. Um, but basically what that enables us to do is to earmark money to put back into this development for the improvements that we're able to do. The town and or the TERS put in all of the parking for Hula Hut, Hydras and Tap House and across the street for the development that's currently under construction with the entertainment venue and the hotel, we put in all of that parking as well. Um, all of everything in Lakefront for parking is considered shared parking. And if it, I mean, because of that flexibility, it has enabled us to, to do the grouping of the development because if they were done independently it would be much more challenging to meet the parking ratios uh, but Fred's been a trooper and been a, uh, very flexible in how we calculate that but it is important you know we there's been so many um, discussions as of late as to how much parking do you truly need where you know where's the right placement for it to ensure that you keep the walkability and the connectivity when you're trying to develop these type of, of overall master planned um, developments within a small area. But it, we, it's been a work in progress, one that will continue probably for another decade. Uh, we keep buying more property as it comes available for future development in the lakefront. And we just continue the vision. And as Fred said, we've been very blessed, both with my board and the council, uh, that it's a unified vision and um, they, they support and give staff a lot of freedom for the recruitment that we do. And they back us 100% in regards to how the development is done and the quality of development that they've allowed us to do and the money we've invested. Back to you, sir. <laughs> I think that's I think we're at the very end and you know again I would just say you know don't be afraid to uh, you know look at your financial options you know look at the way you can do deals with private partnerships you know me and Jeanette's part of the ULI P3 committee and you know it's don't you know don't be afraid to take those chances with those with those partnerships and look at all the financial me mechanisms to make it work. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to allow us guys. to show you Lakefront today. We appreciate it and it's been a privilege. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Jeanette and Fred. That's uh, hats off to you guys for, you know, pulling out all the tools to make that district uh, a destination. You at least have one uh, Hula Hut fan here. <laughs> So um, any, anybody else on our call, feel free to add a question to the chat or, you know, raise your hand or um, if you're, you're on the phone, feel free to speak up and uh, ask everyone, ask our folks from Little Elm any, any other details. 
it's uh, very interesting to hear you guys talk about uh, the shared parking aspect. Um, uh, that I think that's that's really cool because we at the COG are also trying to advance that strategic parking uh, initiatives, which um, Fred, is that like a standard part of, I assume you'll have like a planned unit development district for the area? Yeah, we, we actually are, um, our, we have a lakefront district code and it allows us to have that flexible uh, parking, shared parking in that district. Um, this particular area is in a PD as well, uh, but overall the whole lakefront district, which goes beyond the boundaries of this development we're talking about today, has that ability to, to have a shared parking initiative. In an answer to the question in the chat, um, the TERS is a 30 year TERS and we're about 10 years into it. All right, cool. Well, a lot of good stuff there. Um, and again, I think if anybody has other questions, go ahead and drop those in the chat. And Jeanette and Fred, if you'll stick around, we'll just see if there are any uh, other other discussion points at the end we can add. Um, thank you guys, though. That was a really great presentation. Uh, and I think let's uh, move on to hear from Mike uh, in the city of Terrell and hear about what's what's happening there. So, Mike. So howdy, I'm uh, Mike Sims. I'm uh, the city manager out here in uh, the city of Terrell, and I will just jump into all things uh, downtown Terrell. So the next slide uh, gives you a little intro to everything uh, uh, that you might not know about Terrell. Uh, we were founded in 1873, so we do show up on that walkable um, uh, map uh, because there is a really nice grid system in downtown Terrell and uh, uh, several of the neighborhoods that that surround it are just a really great convenient little walk uh, it's actually a, a great uh, downtown already because there's a grocery store downtown houses downtown downtown uh, loft living downtown retail downtown there's a corporate headquarters of a regional bank downtown so lots of diversity there restaurants and that sort of thing and uh, everything we're doing is just about growing it and making it bigger and better uh, we always have to brag that the first car trip in texas was by a terrell resident he uh, got a uh, vehicle uh, in a in a train shipment and he drove to dallas and uh, of course we always like to joke that he actually uh, broke down in forney and had to get a repair there uh, 1920s, uh, there was an electric interurban between Dallas and Terrell. That was the furthest east in the system. We trained 2,000 British pilots during World War II. So we've got a lot of British history that we like to play up and uh, enjoy. And I'll mention an, a little bit of that here soon. Uh, 18,000 folks live here now. We've got 14,000 jobs. Um, we uh, have a, a important philosophy about who we are as a community, that we want people to live in our city and work in our city and uh, we really believe in uh, that that's a great way to live where you're not having a long commute somewhere um, and that's a very important element about who we are as a city uh, we we kind of pitch ourselves as the retail and employment center of kaufman county and kaufman county uh, in last year's census uh, by percentage was the fastest growing county in the united states and we've been in the top five uh, in one position or another for the last five years so lots of growth going on out here. Also, historically speaking, we're the home of Southwestern Christian College. That's a historically black college that's just uh, a, a little bit to the west of downtown. Uh, we've got a Trinity Valley Community College campus and Health Science Center campus here in town as well, and uh, lots of uh, great growth going on. So the next slide is uh, jumping more into downtown. Uh, we did a downtown plan in 2017 and really got some questions out at the forefront and this is what we're dealing with um, we are we're not a uh, county seat and so with no historic courthouse how do we anchor downtown people tend to expect that if they go to an old downtown where's the where's the center space of it so we wanted to really deal with that as a problem to be solved um, we have the historical element of uh, one side of the railroad track versus the other side of the railroad track. Uh, and it was just frankly, here's the part of the city we're going to spend money and invest in, and here's the part of the city we're going to ignore. All sorts of uh, reasons for that historically. 
Uh, but the goal has been, can we walk from one side or drive from one side of the railroad tracks to the other side and have it look and feel like we're in the same city? So you you lose sidewalks on one side, you get open ditch drainage on, on one side, and on the other side, you've got you know, what you would think of as being a standard street cross section. We also had the problem that one side of the tracks was um, uh, zoned with some um, light industrial uh, um, for it, and uh, that meant that there was a really odd mix of light industrial buildings and residential buildings in an area that just didn't really have any coherent planning for it. Uh, so the question was, can also, uh, the third question here was, can we support downtown uh, with a dedicated funding source for capital improvements? Uh, as we looked at that, we said there's a lot of investment that's going to be necessary in downtown Terrell to really bring it up. Some of that investment might be in private buildings, some in civic buildings, some in roads, water, sewer, drainage, all that sort of good stuff. And uh, we actually went forward uh, and did a uh, election to create a type B, uh, which we carved out of a type A corporation and that type B corporation election happened in sort of the 2018, 2019 period. And that started to kick off funding for uh, those capital improvements. So the next slide um, uh, talks about sort of that list. Um, did the downtown plan, we've done the rezoning, we've done a lot of work to try to get our arms around water, sewer and drainage. Uh, we went to the county and in the 2019 county bond program, we uh, requested funding for uh, quiet zones and complete streets. Uh, as it is with the county bond program, we really only got sort of the seed money for that, uh, but we did get the seed money to do the engineering and the planning work on those. Uh, and we, of course, we want to do a great job with uh, both quiet zones and complete streets. US 80 runs east-west through the city along uh, the uh, uh, railroad tracks, the Union Pacific Railroad tracks there. And so um, those are very proximate and very much right next to each other. Spur 226 is a uh, north-south road uh, that connects uh, US 80 to um, State Highway 34, and it's sort of the um, eastern boundary of the old sit part of downtown. I've got a couple of uh, major building projects I'm going to show you as a course of this, and I'll, I'll hit each of those as I show them to you. Uh, south Alley is the part of um, the city that runs along uh, really a roadway that runs along the Union Pacific Railroad corridor uh, and is in the historic downtown area. We're doing some major projects there and uh, consistent with everything that was just said by our previous presenters, land assembly is a absolute huge deal here and I'll talk about uh, that as well. The cornerstone of all of that is we've really answered the question about, well, how do we create a central place? And, in, and and we wanted to do a town square project. I'll show you that as well. And that town square project is really designed to say, uh, in place of a courthouse, uh, we're gonna build something bigger, better, and more exciting and more wonderful. And uh, we hope everybody loves it as we develop it over the next few years. So the next slide is, um, uh, the zoning side of it uh, for the zoning uh, geeks here on the call. Uh, yellow is some residential uses. Um, uh, purple is commercial. Uh, red is retail. Uh, then in the middle of all of that, you can see uh, a light blue color, and that light blue color is the CBD zoning that we have. Uh, so for years and years, we really only were tending a small section of blocks as a downtown zone. Uh, we recently went through and took, uh, and you can kind of pick it up here as sort of a tan color around the turquoise. Uh, that tan color is a rezoning that we did, and we cleaned up um, quite a few, um, uh, quite a large zone there. I think we rezoned about um, 200 individual parcels with a city initiated in rezoning, and within that area, uh, we really took out light industrial zoning. We took out uh, some. Uh, edges of single family that didn't really make sense. Uh, we got rid of some commercial that didn't make sense. And we put it all in basically a form based code that allows you to build um, uh, retail, restaurant, office, that sort of thing on the first floor. And it allows you to do uh, second, third, fourth floor um, 
residential by right. So you don't have to come back and say, mother, may I? Um, the only thing you need to do is because there's shared parking and public parking throughout the zone, uh, there's not a specific parking requirement with any of that zoning that I just described, uh, but there is a requirement for a site plan so we can see how close you are and how you might access some of the public parking nearby or what you're going to do to provide parking access. Uh, the next slide is um, uh, a, a, a sort of a combo pack of uh, explaining the downtown project. So you can kind of read right there where it says core zone. That's where the older buildings are in uh, downtown Terrell. And that's what, if you drive through Terrell, you would say, oh, okay, now I'm in the downtown uh, because you see buildings that date back to the 1890s and 1910s and that sort of thing. Um, uh, to the west of that, where it says commercial transition zone on sort of the left hand side of the slide, that's where Southwestern Christian College is. Um, and so we're uh, working with them uh, to help them expand the college. Uh, the idea sort of is as they grow and expand, we want them to grow toward downtown. And as we grow and expand downtown, we want to reach out to them. And then on the east side, there's that longer purple strip there, and that is uh, US 80 running out to the Terrell State Hospital. So that's a major employer for us. It's a state supported mental health hospital. Uh, we have about 900 employees there and we really have it hiding uh, where the only way you can access it is going through a residential neighborhood. And that's just part of the history of how it got developed uh, way back when. Uh, so you can see the green line on here is a new entryway, which would be a grand entryway to the Terrell State Hospital. It would allow them to do a mental health museum up on the corner of 80 and the intersection there. And that would be sort of the eastern hub of downtown. On the western hub, we're helping Southwestern Christian College assemble some land so that they aren't just a south side of the railroad tracks uh, school. They also will be able to have a presence up on US 80. So we feel like we've got these two end points, east and west, where if we brought our good partner up to US 80 and helped them front on US 80, it would really help uh, everybody understand and create that walkable district where you could really feel like, because the distances are not terribly much, um, you, you would feel comfortable walking from one uh, to the other and passing back and forth through downtown. So uh, the pink line on here is the South Alley. There's a very thin green line that goes through the middle of this. That's the railroad tracks. And then uh, the blue line on here is uh, Spur 226. Uh, the town square project is shown on here, and so you can see how it all works together. The complete streets on US 80 and Spur 226, a very large new town square project and um, uh, quiet zones uh, improvements where we're really doing more than the minimum for quiet zones on all of those because we really want to invest in making great pedestrian crossings of all of those different railroad track crossings. I think we've got about 13 that run through the central part of town, and we have to make specific improvements on each one of those in order to make um, uh, that a much more an, an improved walkable area. The red squares in the map are uh, parking areas that we've identified that we have under a condemnation process right now. And the main eight blocks that we're buying for the town square, some of it is land that we've slowly uh, and meticulously picked up over the last five years in anticipation of this project. And then uh, the rest of it are a series of condemnations that we're doing at this time with some funding provided by our city council uh, last year. So that's sort of a visual of how all they uh, they all work together. Uh, the next slide is um, uh, just the quiet zone itself. Um, again, uh, we've got um, Kimley Horn working on this for us. Um, uh, the main part of it is 148 to Birch. We think it's about a $12 million project within that zone. And we've got some preliminary ideas about the design of most of those right now so that we're figuring out OK, exactly what do we need to do there to uh, not just make it great for cars, but great for uh, safety and great for the uh, pedestrians who we really very much want moving back and forth across the railroad tracks. One of the interesting notes about the quiet zone study is that we early on um, got word from Union Pacific that they're planning on double tracking through downtown Terrell at some point in the next uh, few years. And so we're doing all of our quiet zone planning with all the measurements appropriate for 
um, uh, the setbacks away from uh, the railroad tracks to be the right distances whenever they are uh, expanded to two uh, tracks downtown. And that is increased cost now, but it allows us to keep our uh, quiet zones even after the um, even after the uh, um, double tracking downtown. So the next slide uh, shows you um, the uh, complete streets part of it. So this is a, a, a little bit tighter view of that uh, in that core zone area there. Again, that's the downtown. Uh, that's the historical part in the two commercial transition zones. Uh, as part of this effort, uh, we're also going to be doing a uh, zoning overlay of the two commercial transition zones. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, not only that form based zone in the core part is in effect, but even also for these commercial transition zones uh, that they also get what they need in terms of a proper zoning overlay. Uh, the next slide uh, gives you a little bit of um, a summary of what we've got going on complete streets. Um, uh, Kim Lee Horn is again the same consultant we're using there so that we could have coordination between the two. Uh, we're about to invite uh, several folks onto a project review committee so that we can have a little committee that we're hoping uh, we'll get a appointee from COG, uh, Union Pacific, Kaufman County. We've already talked to Mober over at TxDOT about having a TxDOT representative on it. And then uh, Paddock is our Park and Downtown Improvement Corporation. That's that type B corporation uh, that's specially dedicated to downtown uh, improvements. So we're doing some engineering right now, a lot of survey work going on, uh, environmental utilities, traffic analysis, that sort of thing. Um, as a former COG Transportation Department employee, I couldn't couldn't do it without doing a uh, traffic model. So we're going to do a fairly in-depth traffic model of the uh, downtown area and make sure that we are uh, really, uh, wherever we change traffic flow, uh, we're doing the right thing with that. Probably the leading option in people's imagination right now is to change it to a one way couplet. So this would be similar to the way Louisville, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, initiated the uh, one way couplet in downtown Louisville. Um, we feel like that's probably a more efficient way for us to handle it. So US 80 is only on Moore Avenue now. Uh, and the thought is to make the eastbound on Moore Avenue and then the westbound would be on Nash, which is one block to the north. Uh, that would give us an opportunity to do much, much larger sidewalks on Moore Avenue uh, and also help us redevelop Nash as a um, complete street as well. So we think that might be a pretty good idea, but that's part of the reason to have the project review committee is to really get some analysis on that question. Uh, another option would be eliminating the left turn lanes on US 80. Uh, another one would be to reduce lane widths, remove lanes, reduce or eliminate parallel parking. Of course, taking off parallel parking is probably contrary to the goal of my local businesses. Uh, so that might not be uh, the most popular suggestion there. Uh, we think uh, that this project is probably somewhere around a uh, $25 million project. Our Park and Downtown Improvement Corporation is um, preparing its budget so it could have $5 million available for that. And then uh, we would go try to get a grant for $20 million to do uh, the US 80 part of it. Uh, the SPUR 226 part we think is more expensive and we would just be doing that as sort of the next phase in, in the process. So you can see we're a little bit earlier uh, in our uh, efforts than maybe Little Elm is. Uh, we started in 1873, uh, but uh, now we've got to go back and correct mistakes and uh, take some more steps going forward. So the next slide is um, uh, just kind of the unified version of both of this. Uh, we are under a work scope with Kimberly Horn that we just started for a million dollars to go over the next 12 months. Uh, it's reimbursable out of the county bond program. Uh, that's where we'll set up that project review committee. Uh, we have a big community engagement uh, element to this. We had Kimberly Horn bring on JBJ management, uh, which does a lot of community engagement work for DART uh, to help us out in that because we want to make sure we fully involve the community and get everybody on board there. Uh, data collection, survey work, all the standard things will be uh, what we try to take care of over the next uh, 12 months and really honing in that sort of big picture price tag into something that is refined for each of the different options so that, that the city council and the paddock board can look at it and say, okay, that option is that expensive and we like that one the best. 
the next slide is um, uh, sort of a, a fun idea. Uh, we have our British Museum is out at the airport right now, and generally the dynamic is it's hard to find. It's in an old metal building next to the airport, and it really doesn't invite you in a way that is a dynamic way of saying, wow, here's a lot of British history that's associated with World War II uh, that happened out here in Terrell. So since it's very unique and authentic to us, nobody else trained 2,000 pilots, uh, we, we have a lot of storytelling to do there, and uh, we think we can kind of play off of it to tell other stories about British and American cooperation over the course of time. And so as we are looking for, well, how could we make that more of an attraction? How could we make that something that uh, doesn't just help the airport, but helps also downtown and downtown businesses? Uh, we really came up with the idea of buying a building downtown uh, we picked the ugliest one and the one that was going to cost the most money to rehab because uh, we figured we'd take on that challenge instead of letting it sit there as an eyesore waiting for somebody in the private sector to do it. Uh, so basically, uh, we took a, a, a very dilapidated structure. Uh, we bought it about a year and a half ago, and uh, we have uh, an architect by the name of Mark Thacker working on it. He's done a lot of um, historical courthouse renovations in East Texas, and we're getting ready to go to bid on this project. Uh, it'll make it a four-story building, uh, about 4,000 square foot for each of the floors, a uh, little bit of a gift shop on the first floor, uh, an event uh, venue on the top floor. It's designed so you can go up to the fourth floor and kind of look down and see what's going on on both the front side, uh, the north side, and the south side. Uh, so it's a pretty exciting project for us and just being able to show this to developers and show what the city investment is, what we're about to do has really helped us uh, over the last year and a half attract people to downtown because they're seeing the city investment in downtown with what we're doing with this building. Uh, and of course, we're uh, using our hotel occupancy taxes to support the fact that, um, you know, the museum is not a self-sustaining museum at this time. It's a private museum, and we're trying to uh, help get more people coming to town by using some of our hotel occupancy tax to help for the operations of that. Uh, we think it's about a $5 million project. Of course, we'll go to bid here in these inflationary times and find out what it really is. Um, there's overhead electrical in the south. We think that's a $3 million project. Uh, we're going to combine those two because we've talked to some GCs who think we can get it done better uh, by doing it as one coordinated project. It's actually unsafe to build the project with as close as the power lines happen to be to it. And one of our goals is that the south side of this building really faces that new town square. So we want to make it very attractive on the south alley side and uh, do some uh, balconies off the south side of it that will let you kind of overlook and um, observe what's going on, watch the trains as they pass, and have that be another element of, oh, this is a friendly place in this alley uh, because you have more of the balcony style and pedestrian friendly element associated with that. Uh, the next slide touches a little bit more on uh, that South Alley part. So there's a zoomed in version of it. Uh, you can see the British flag there. You can see those vacant lots just on the south side of the railroad tracks. We're currently trying to arm wrestle with Union Pacific Railroad to acquire those vacant parcels from them. Uh, the uh, uh, buildings off to the west side of the Union Pacific parcels just south of the railroad tracks. Parts of that are also under Union Pacific ownership. We're working on acquiring those. There's an old historic depot in town that's just to the east side that actually happens to be owned by Star Transit and uh, the, uh, they have a ground lease on the parking lot and the ground that you see there. Uh, that's that little skinny building that's right up against the railroad tracks on the uh, east side of the uh, uh, vacant lots. Uh, so we're trying to get that acquired. The next vacant lot to the east on the other side of Spur 226 there is also owned by Union Pacific, and they use it as a staging area for construction. And so we don't, um, uh, and for maintenance of their line. Uh, so we don't like that a bit. Uh, that's a very ugly thing to have in downtown. And we're also working on buying that vacant lot from Union Pacific so that, again, we can do a combination of parking and green up against the railroad tracks uh, with some landscaping and a little bit of parking so that we can uh, have a better buffer edge along the railroad tracks than what's there now. 
um, that green area is also where we would be doing the um, electrical project. Uh, the next slide, uh, I think, just summarizes um, that scope of work. Uh, basically, we're going to take uh, power lines down over a three block area and um, uh, make sure that we uh, provide all new feeds for those old historic buildings. Uh, a lot of the buildings that we survey and talk to developers about, uh, of course, one of the major rehab costs is taking out an electrical system that might be from the 1940s or 1950s and, and rewiring it to modern standards. And so us feeding new electrical as part of this project uh, uh, is going to be very helpful for our rework. Uh, one of our other projects in the South Alley is to replace all the water lines and sewer lines uh, that are in the South Alley. And as we do that, we're actually installing uh, grease traps. We're installing uh, connections for fire risers and fire risers, uh, the sort of thing that you need to do in an old downtown area to, again, help the value of those uh, older buildings downtown. Uh, the next slide. Uh, is our facade improvement program that's also funded through our park and downtown improvement uh, corporation we have the fun element that we turn 150 next year and so we are doing uh, what we refer to as the sesquicentennial murals project uh, and getting some additional murals up we just did a mural of uh, jamie fox uh, through a private contributor uh, uh, that's actually in the south alley uh, we had a lot of reaction from citizens saying, oh my gosh, why'd you put uh, Jamie Foxx in the South Alley? Uh, and you have to explain, uh, well, that's actually the best place because that's going to be fronting the brand new town square. And uh, that's one of the best places and it will be one of the, 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 the most prominent locations in the future. Um, and it just happens that the private funding partner for that uh, got a little ahead of us. Uh, but again, that's good news. We're showing plans to folks and the private sector is reacting by saying, hey, I'm going to get out in front of that. Uh, we're also spending, again, like I said, additional money on facade improvements. Uh, we have an architect, uh, Mark Thacker, again, who is an expert on historical topics like this. And for no charge, we will send him out to look at one of the historic buildings for you and just advise the property owner about some of the basic steps and most important things to do to stay historic with their look and their renovation. And that's been very helpful for us. And also, we've actually funded uh, the rehab of several of those buildings downtown. So the next slide shows you a highlight on uh, a couple of those. Uh, this is the Anderson building. Uh, so this is actually the largest building downtown by uh, square footage. It's a four story building with a basement. Uh, it used to be a hospital, uh, used to be several other things as well. Um, and uh, right now, the only thing operating in it is a health club. And so we've got an owner who bought a different building downtown. He's moving the health club out. And then we've signed up for about a $400,000 incentive for him to assist him with renovating this. He's doing lofts on the first, uh, on the top two floors. Uh, the second floor will be a little boutique hotel. The bottom floor will be a restaurant and a little bit of retail. And then that basement floor will be the bar to the, um, uh, restaurant because it kind of has a very uh, creepy sort of a speakeasy style to it uh, that we think will be a nice fun little addition there. Uh, he's also doing uh, the property across the street again with a city incentive. So if you flip the uh, PowerPoint slide uh, on the next slide, you see um, uh, this time a rendering. Um, so this is actually across the street from the building I just showed you. Uh, the city owns a vacant lot there just out of historical reasons. We've owned it for probably 25 years, never did anything with it, just have been uh, mowing it. Uh, and when he came along and purchased the, the, the building, uh, he raised his hand and said, hey, I'm going to do a restaurant here. We're providing a small financial incentive for him to do that. Uh, and we decided that the best thing to do would be to lease him this vacant city lot uh, and let him make a series of improvements so we'd have a great outdoor dining location. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm not actually a fun person, but they are going to do lots of fun things on this. And so there's outdoor uh, fun things to do. And if I was better at fun, I would describe it better, but they have uh, music and outdoor activities planned out there. 
and um, people are actually good at fun uh, planning and coordinating that. And of course, we love that because that's an outdoor thing to do. And so this is just a short uh, one and a half block walk from that British Museum. So it really kind of ties together. One of the incentives uh, that we gave our museum uh, was that as they came in and relocated downtown, we gave them certain hours they had to be open, which we intended to be conducive for people to leave uh, the museum and then say, yeah, I'm gonna go out to eat or I'm gonna go do a little bit of shopping. So they have times where they're open at night uh, just specifically so that we could help drive uh, some tourism activities downtown associated with that. Uh, and you can see on the uh, south side of the building there uh, where it says uh, three phrase uh, transformer. This is another one of those places where taking down the utility lines really made sense based from a safety standpoint and, and an aesthetic standpoint. They're just so old and so um, poorly placed uh, that this was another location where uh, we really needed to to bite the bullet and make that improvement in taking those power lines down. Uh, the next slide is um, um, town square concepts. So uh, we actually got the entire city council was so enthusiastic about this that at TML last year, uh, we all went on a little tour of some things in the Houston area. And so we're standing at McGovern Park, which is real close to the Arts District in downtown uh, Houston or just off downtown Houston. Uh, the one on the left with the horses is um, uh, one of the uh, suburban uh, town uh, centers uh, over there in uh, Houston. So uh, probably not the best shot of that because we really liked the visual of uh, the Sugar Land downtown where there's mixed use with uh, dining on the first floor and then offices and uh, residential above it. They're anchoring it with their uh, city hall. Uh, and so since we're going to have a lot of civic buildings in our town square, we thought that was an important thing to look at. Um, the other shot here that looks so majestic is uh, the uh, University Mall at Rice. And so one of the things that we identified doing our town square planning, I mean, I should say that we actually asked our uh, city council, do you want to do the small scale version of a town square? And, and that was really the idea in 2017 was buy one block, uh, that happened to be vacant at the time. It was the only vacant block downtown, so we got that purchased. We said, well, we'll buy one block and put a park on it, and we'll buy another block next to it and develop a library on it, and we're going to call it good. That's, that's what we'll do. We'll have a library on a block, we'll have a town square on a block, and we'll just zone it around it, and we'll hope that the private sector reacts. So we gave them that as an idea, and then we said, well, we'll give them another out of the box idea. And that is we create basically what looks like a university mall downtown. And uh, in order to do that, you gotta get the dimensions right. Uh, we find that about 300 feet wide is a good dimension between buildings. And then a 900 feet long gives you a pretty long uh, healthy area. That's three football fields, right? Uh, gives you a pretty long uh, area within which to do a lot of programmatic type activities. So the McGovern uh, Park shot here in the middle with the city council standing there, um, that is a good um, uh, visual of that. Uh, those arbors that you see on the sort of side to side direction there, um, uh, they're a little under uh, 300 feet in width. Uh, at McGovern Park in Houston, there's a raised mound that you can walk up and look. Uh, that's what's behind us there. I'm going to say that's actually about 600 feet behind us in that shot. So that was helping the city council get a sense of scale of, oh, okay, this is really the shape that we're going for here. And then the buildings at Rice really helped you uh, help the city council get their arms around the idea of, will it make sense to do a four or five story building there? Uh, and so uh, the answer was yes, it, it makes sense. You can handle the massing and uh, ring those buildings. For us, we wanted to create a quieter place downtown. Uh, and, and the notion was that, well, US 80, a lot of traffic is always going to go through that part of downtown. Railroad tracks, even with a quiet zone, that's a big, heavy, loud thing to go through downtown. So we felt like we wanted to provide a pedestrian space where it was ringed by buildings where once you entered that interior pedestrian space, you could have a lot of green, you could have the protection of the buildings, and you wouldn't have any automobile traffic within that zone. Uh, and of course, it's ringed by friendly streets on the outside of it, and uh, I'll show you that as well. Uh, but it was really that internal 
um, auto free area that that really captured city council's um, uh, uh, passion. Um, we we did this in an interesting way because um, we we wanted to make sure they understood this means you're buying a lot of land. And so we actually brought forward at the same meeting the approval of the plan and a contract with uh, a land service company uh, that specializes in land condemnation. We said, OK, if you're serious about this, let's vote to approve the plan and vote to hire the firm to support the acquisition of the land at the same time. And we got um, uh, five to nothing votes on both of those uh, right there uh, because they said, yep, this is definitely what we want to do. And that's just kind of the practice of making sure that we're buying in, we're getting buy-in from our, our full uh, elect group of elected officials there. Uh, the next slide uh, uh, keeps rolling here. And uh, here's just a, a planning shot of it. Again, the British flags where the British Museum is, the US 80 there, South Alley, the railroad tracks kind of um, uh, are the, the middle thing there. Uh, the two red areas there that say surface parking, those those vacant lots that we're trying to acquire. And then you can see the eight block area. Catherine is the street in town that we use to delineate. Uh, are you on an east block like 100 east, 200 east and so on? Or are you west block? 100 west 100 or 200 west or whatever so Catherine's actually the dividing line uh in the city of terrell for that we actually close Catherine from broad to newton uh and get rid of it because that's the way we're creating these blocks so we're we're shutting grove we're shutting cottage we're shutting rochester and uh, that helps us create that overall large internal mall area so we've got a great grid system right now uh, and it, it allows us to sort of combine blocks uh, to create that. The blue on the map are the um, uh, building footprints that we have in mind. Uh, and so, as you can see, that's just sort of ringing that green area. Again, the green area shown on the map is 300 foot by 900 foot in the internal side of it. So all the buildings are planned to be about, a, about 150 foot deep. And then we'll do uh, good treatments. The bordering streets are Broad, Adelaide, Francis, and Newton. And we'll be doing uh, a curbless design on those four streets as we rebuild them to, again, accentuate pedestrian friendliness uh, on uh, those surrounding streets around that. Virginia here uh, that you can see marked on this map is spur 226. And so the strategy was, well, hey, this all lines up very nicely uh, because we can uh, uh, use the focal point of the middle of truly the center of the city. And then we can work with private developers to redef uh, redevelop uh, the area along uh, the more major roadway corridor of Virginia over there. Um, so, and again, red is is surface parking areas that we're also working on purchasing right now. Uh, the next slide is um, um, just sort of phasing issues. Uh, KSA is working with us on this one, and uh, they're under contract analyzing that infrastructure for about one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. While we do have a a loose form based code downtown right now, that's in terms of the zoning requirements really don't have an architectural style guide. Uh, so they're going to create that for us as well and create an uh, overlay around this area that says, hey, this are, these are things you, you need to be doing architecturally as you do that. Uh, we've got some library community center work because the first civic building will be relocating our existing and way too small library over in that area. And then lots and lots of community uh, participation in that. Uh, the next slide is um, uh, the library uh, uh, town square next steps here. The idea with library is that uh, we really want it to be a location that is library as in true, here's the books, uh, but also community center with lots of different things, maker spaces and all of the bells and whistles that you can do with a modern library where you're really inviting the community in. And it may be that they're um, they're checking out, so to speak, a room to do sewing in or a room to do a knitting class in or something like that. And all the supplies you need for for that are there. Our senior center is in a 1919 building uh, that is actually 
uh, a renovated old fire station from 1919. So we are sorely in need of a new senior center as well. And uh, we're planning to have that coordinated in there as well. Um, 720 Design is the architectural firm we're working with there, and they're under contract with us to do some more needs assessment work. Uh, I think they uh, told us we needed an 80,000 square foot uh, library, and then we're trying to program the community center and senior center right now with our next contract with them so we can get square footage requirements on that as well. In many cases, we don't think that this is showing a, a standalone library, but uh, what we're really thinking is that um, most of our library will be maybe the second floor so that the active uses of maybe restaurants and retail can be on the first floor and then the second, third or fourth or fifth floors will be some combination of uh, multifamily. Uh, the next slide there is uh, trying to wrap it up to stay as close to on time as I can. Uh, and so this is just sort of calendaring it out. Uh, on, on what we're doing. I love the fact that um, both the uh, Carrollton project and the Little Elm project talked about how long these things take. Uh, I've been preaching that over and over and over again to everybody in the city of Terrell on expectations. Um, uh, I showed you a lot of things here. I would say that in FY23, the thing I'll highlight that we're going to do is we're going to do about a $900,000 engineering study because all of the area that is town square that I showed you is all open ditch drainage in old roadways with no real coordinated way to drain that water. Um, so we had an exciting conversation this morning about, well, is that engineering firm going to be called to scope that project with a 100 year storm in mind or a 25 year storm in mind? And it's an easy answer, right? We're going to be doing some basement and underground parking here, probably better to drain it for a 100 year storm. And so uh, that's the sort of uh, detail that you get into uh, with these things. And uh, it's fun, you know, uh, it's a good step and our city council will see progress on it and be willing to pay for uh, that hefty drainage work uh, because it really meets two goals. One is it gives you progress on the town square and it also gives you progress on this um, uh, very uh, thorn in the side kind of uh, el element and problem we have in Terrell with open ditch drainage in the neighborhood that's on the south side of the railroad tracks. So that's sort of where we stand. And um, I guess the last thing I would say is that uh, shame on me if I don't say as an absolute shameless plug for the city of Terrell, that if you'd like to work on this project and you're out there somewhere, we're going to hire a, a municipal development director and a city engineer here in the next few weeks and months. So send me an email at mikesims at cityofterrell.org if you would like to know why is the city manager presenting it's because I'm uh, hiring uh, to replace some folks who are retiring and uh, would love to have somebody who gets passionate about these kind of things working uh, with us. Uh, I started working in the Environmental Resources Department in COG in 1993 and got to work on a lot of this stuff uh, way back when and uh, been passionate about it for years. So uh, that's my little presentation and my shameless plug for new employees to come to the city of Terrell. All right. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mike, for that presentation. And uh, if we have any questions, feel free for Mike. Uh, put those in the chat. Um, if you have resumes for Mike, I guess just Please. email those. Email those to him directly. <laughs> um, but don't put them in the chat. Uh, no. So. All right. Well, lots of lots of good planning there happening in Terrell. Uh, quite a quite a bit of stuff that I had no idea. Uh, was even on the scope there in, in Terrell, uh, especially the British Museum. To, didn't know about that, but pretty cool stuff. Uh, thanks. So thanks, Mike. I'm going to go ahead and uh, have our Dallas folks jump into a presentation on uh, the Redbird Mall project. So I see we've got Kevin and Daniel. Uh, if you guys are ready, take it away. Thank you, Travis and Mike. I'll, I'll come work for you for a quarter of a million a year. Just give me a call. Um, so I am Kevin Spath, Assistant Director with the City's uh, Office of Economic Development. Uh, with me today is Daniel Church, who's in the Planning and Urban Design Department for the City. Daniel just jumped out of his City Plan Commission meeting, so I, I appreciate him playing double duty today. Uh, Daniel wears a couple of different hats for the City, but one of the most important hats he wears is 
the staff support for the city's urban design peer review panel. And we'll talk about what that is in a moment. But, um, you know, I, I had a whole bunch of jokes lined up because I was sitting here a while. I We could have probably had Kimley Horn just do the entire two hours of presentations because they're working on everybody's stuff, <laughs> including ours. We could have had JBJ as well, Mike. They're part of our, our project here. Um, so Peter Broski is the majority owner and co-developer of this project and this property. Terrence Maiden, who many of you may know, uh, has his own little boutique real estate development company called Russell Glenn. He is also a co-developer. Next slide. So I'm going to fly through background project history as quickly as I can because I want to turn it over to Daniel with enough time to talk about urban design and walkability. I mean, we're, we're dealing with probably the most unwalkable place on earth, uh, an auto centric enclosed shopping mall from the 70s. It, I, you know, I think it has a negative walk score or probably did when we started this project, but we're talking about retrofitting uh, the most unwalkable place you could think of. And in as a difference from the two previous presentations and projects, the city does not own anything in this project. Um, and so everything we're, we're doing and all the influence we're able to have on the design of the project is through carrots and not through sticks or not through property ownership. Um, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with Southern Dallas, it's this project is at 67 and I-20. Uh, just a couple of minutes away from Duncanville, DeSoto, and Lancaster. Uh, this is a mall that was built in the mid-70s. Uh, it was originally called Redbird Mall. Um, it's got 90 acres inside the ring road and 34 acres outside of the ring road. It was um, started to come into disuse and decline in the mid-1990s. Uh, it had competition from new retail, new regional retail along I-20 in Duncanville and DeSoto and Lancaster, but it also had some crime issues that were um, maybe overblown or um, some bad press that ended up really hurting the property. In 2001, the owners at the time tried to just rebrand the property as Southwest Center uh, to try and shed that stigma, um, but it didn't work. Next slide. So like most malls, um, if you're lucky to have one or two or three like we do, um, you know, it's a giant sea of parking. It's got an inline portion and it's got several anchors. Uh, this had five anchors originally, um, Sears, JCPenney, Dillard's, Macy's, and Burlington Coat Factory was added a little bit after the original opening. But the irony is that Burlington Coat Factory is the only operating anchor left. Uh, Sears, of course, they spun off all their real estate to a REIT and closed their doors in 2019. Uh, the JC Penney was actually vacated 20 years ago and demolished in 2012. Um, Dillard's, which is the, the building on the south there, was vacated in 06 and Macy's more recently in 17. The inline portion of the mall is almost 400,000 square feet. And it's never been empty. It's always been occupied. And at the time uh, that we really got serious about this project, it was 65% occupied. All the previous owners of the inline mall through the 1990s and 2000s did nothing but milk this property for cash flow. Uh, there was no reinvestment. There was no attempt to keep uh, maintenance up. And so it really fell into disrepair. Next slide couple of quick images of what the building and the parking lots look like. Um, next slide. So as the two previous projects also mentioned, we've been doing this for a really long time. 13, 14 years ago, this started in earnest. We brought in, uh, as the city brought in uh, ULI for a national five day you know, adv advisory services panel. Um, 
they basically said all the things we already knew. The, the, the market down there was too weak to justify private investment without the public getting involved. There was fragmented ownership that made redevelopment challenging and there was no vision for redevelopment. Next slide. So they recommended that the city get active in helping to recruit investors and developers to get active in getting land assembled to consolidate, consolidate the ownership and get some control of the site. Um, to establish a TIF district for long term public investments and to articulate a community based vision. Next slide. So what did the city do? We started tackling each one of those things. Um, in 2012, Mayor Rawlings at the time launched what was called Grow South um, and that put Redward Mall as a as a core investment area focus area of everything we were doing. We created the mall area redevelopment tip district two years later to uh, attract start to attract viable development partners and stimulate investment. We got we got active with recruiting investors and developers and then that led to the next slide. In 2015, a guy named Peter Brodsky walked into my office and at the request of the mayor and Peter is not a developer he's a hedge fund guy and uh, entering his 40s he was looking for something charitable to do with his money and if peter was on the call i think he uh, he would agree with me at the time he didn't know what the hell he was doing um, but he had an opportunity to make a bid to uh, acquire most of the of the inline portion of the mall and several of the anchors and on a handshake, he put up a big chunk of his own money to try and whoop, to try and get control of that mall in an online auction. And so we ended up doing a deal, a, a $2.4 million grant to help him get control of that property. Um, and at the time, he had no idea what he was going to do with it. Next slide. So in 2015, before Peter got involved, you can see the, the fragmentation of ownership with the multiple colors on the left. Uh, six different owners inside the ring road, 30, about 30 different owners outside of the ring road. And since Peter has acquired most of the inline portion of the mall, he's also gone on to get control of most of the other parcels in the mega block. Next slide. So for two and a half years after he acquired what he acquired in 2015 he acquired more properties and did a whole bunch of analysis of the market looking at what the assets of the area were um, for those of you who don't know there's a bunch of mega churches uh, right around th this site and so you know there's 50,000 plus members of the, those mega churches that live and work in this area and spend most of their sunday in this area a uh, bunch of educational assets with a number of colleges, Cedar Valley College, Dallas Baptist, UNT Dallas, Paul Quinn College, and a bunch of the Dallas College, community college campuses. Um, he also, you know, basically hired a whole bunch of people to help them understand how to develop, completing a bunch of engineering studies, cost estimates, starting to talk about trying to keep the existing anchors that were still there. Uh, but really looking at what new users could come if he kind of reimagined what the place could be. And he also rebranded it as Reimagine Redbird. At the time, you can see the picture on the on the right hand side. At the time, there was only one Starbucks in Southern Dallas, and it wasn't even really in Southern Dallas. It was on I-30 at, at Westmoreland, I think, um, which doesn't even really count. So we were able to just on the fact that uh, Peter had acquired the property and the city was involved, we were able to attract Starbucks uh, and they built a new ground up store right at the front entrance on the out parcel. Um, and that got things really going from there. Next slide. Um, in 2017, Peter came forward with his development team and proposed to retrofit the entire property 
um, trying to bring it into a horizontally mixed use place uh, involving renovations and reconfigurations and repurposing of much of the existing mall structure, uh, looking at class A office space, converting to medical office and to diversify retail and restaurant space. But it also included selectively demolishing a part of the mall and doing new construction in the parking lots uh, to try and reclaim the parking lots. Also establishing a new one acre green space and disaggregating the entire site into walkable blocks that could be developed incrementally. Next slide. These are just some images of 2018 at the time. You know, you can see site improvements that didn't exist in 2018, including number of new internal roads to split the site up. Um, you can see down at the bottom images of adding transparency to existing buildings, adding new entryways to existing buildings, adding daylighting to existing buildings, um, and then uh, adding the public open space on the upper right to help uh, provide an amenity for retail and restaurant. Next slide. So in 2018, the city stepped up to the plate and offered a very complex incentive package involving a multitude of tools and layers of funding, uh, a $10 million conditional grant, a $12 million interest only loan. So that's $22 million in cash, uh, a $15.6 million award of tax increment funding uh, that would be created by the project in the future, but that uh, tax increment award would be reassigned back to the city, so the developer wouldn't see any of that. Uh, that would uh, help pay, pay down the loan. Um, next slide. By 2019, everything was executed and the project got going in earnest. You can see the groundbreaking there. Next slide. So these next few slides are just some details about how complicated this whole thing is. Um, in 2020, we did uh, our first batch of amendments to the deals, and we also uh, facilitated a new markets tax credit transaction that generated $2 million of equity to the project. A couple months later, we did another batch of amendments to the deal and increased the amount of the conditional grant by $3 million in geo bond funds. Also at that time, uh, Peter had acquired the Sears property, and so we had to add the Sears property to the entire deal on the project. Next slide. In 2021, we helped facilitate uh, a PACE financing tra transaction, Property Says Clean Energy, through our Dallas PACE program that secured $3.3 million for um, modernizing the inline portion of the mall with new lighting, plumbing, and HVAC. A couple months later, we actually extended the, the material dates and deadlines in the entire deal by 12 months due to COVID impacts, as I'm sure everyone has been doing lately. Uh, and then a month later, we did another batch of amendments to this deal. Uh, next slide. So a little bit of detailed progress um, on the retail side. Like I said, Starbucks was the thing that started it all in 2017. And then Foot Locker committed uh, to do um, a new freestanding building, 20,000 square foot that actually fronts on the little one acre park, which you can see in that image. Uh, Frost Bank is also committed uh, to being at the site. They're in a a renovated freestanding building in one of the out parcels. Um, next slide. So office was the big thing that I think was the game changer, or has been the game changer here. Um, we were able to help the developer attract a number of office users. And again, these office users are going into a an existing retail oriented mall. So it in, involves a substantial rehab of these existing buildings to make this possible. Um, the one at the bottom is the one I would mention is probably the most important. Um, 
Chime Solutions, a company out of Atlanta, Georgia. We recruited them through our business development activities uh, to locate here. They're the, they are the first office deal in Southern Dallas ever. This, is, this deal has brought 2,000 jobs to this site in about 18 months. There's 500 to 700 people working in this office facility during the daytime. Um, they took 52,000 square feet on the second floor and then did an expansion a um, couple months later to take another 33,000. So they've got about 80,000 square feet of converted what was retail space on the second floor of the inline portion of the mall. Next slide. The other game changer is medical office. So Parkland uh, and UT Southwestern have committed to um, opening facilities here. So Parkland just opened a couple months ago, but they're in the former Dillard's building. UT Southwestern is in the former Sears building with uh, children's health also being on the second floor of that building. Next slide. Uh, big part of the project, I heard Palladium uh, already mentioned today, but Palladium uh, has developed the first apartments on, on the site, a new construction. It was 300 units of Class A, 70% of which are affordable at or below 60% of the area median income, with 30% being market rate units. Uh, this was a complicated deal where our, our initial incentive package uh, help the developer make all the horizontal improvements that were necessary to get the six acre site ready for vertical development. Then the developer, the vertical developer, Palladium, executed a purchase and sale agreement and then assigned that purchase and sale agreement to the city's housing finance corporation. And then the housing finance corporation uh, ground leased it back to Palladium to actually build the project. Uh, this pro project was fully leased day one. Uh, and now I think there's five to 700 people on a waiting list. So there was clearly unmet demand for new residential uh, product product in this submarket. Next slide. The newest component that we're adding to the project is a hotel. Um, we recently had council approve a deal for a courtyard and residence in dual branded by Marriott. It's going to be located just south across the street from the Planium Apartments, five story, 164 rooms developed by Atlantic Hotels Group. Um, the, the three or four bullets down here have actually changed in, in four months. The total project cost, which was 31 million uh, four months ago, is as of last week, is now 44 million. Uh, and our incentive of 3.3 million is now going to have to be in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 million to make this deal actually pencil and go to construction. But we think we can rescue it. Next slide. So here's we're going to turn it over to Daniel to talk about the role of urban design in this project. Daniel, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon, everybody. Daniel Church with the city's planning and urban design department. So. You know, as Kevin said and kind of set up, all the components are there in terms of having a, a, the mixture of uses that we like to see to to deliver the kind of, uh, you know, 18 hour to uh, 18 hour to 24 hour neighborhood. Um, so what was really important was designing all of the pieces correctly and putting all the pieces together so that this could become a district and not just a series of developments. And so this develop this development plan that you see right here is the latest and greatest of the development plans. Um, but as I'll talk about in a few slides, it's had different iterations and has had to be flexible over time. Uh, next slide. So like with all of our projects that uh, come through, uh, get any sort of incentives from the city, um, all projects are required to go to the city's urban design peer review panel, which Kevin mentioned earlier. So my role with the city is to manage that panel and manage that process. So projects receive urban design comments from professionals and then staff works with the development team to implement those. And I'll give some examples of what that looked like on this project specifically. But in 2018, when the initial uh, concept plan came through, 
the panel was really interested in thinking about the internal network of streets, how open space could occur on site, how the ring road could be used to be more than just a, a road for cars, but maybe a wellness trail. So all of those were comments that have ultimately gotten worked into the development agreement with, with Peter Brodsky and team. In addition to that, uh, something else that was part of the agreement had to do with the design of those internal streets. So typically, you know, this, this is un, unlike a lot of our projects that would have typically come through a PD or some sort of uh, defined zoning that would have outlined that in the zoning. This is just standard MU mixed use zoning. And so these are private roads. And so typically we wouldn't have control over what the streetscape standards would be. But since uh, the city has a lot of skin in the game, the development agreement outlined sidewalk dimensions, street trees, street furniture, how buildings engage with the sidewalk. That way we know that over time what gets built is really setting up that framework for walkability. So as I mentioned from on the last slide, one of the critical things is preserving flexibility, knowing that depending on what tenants ultimately come to the site, engineering challenges that are ultimately that that bubble up throughout the process, there's going to need to be flexibility, but at the same time, still delivering that walkable mixed use neighborhood. That's that's been the goal the whole time. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the, the overall site plan came through peer review panel in 2018. Every su subsequent construction phase also is, is required to come through the review process. So the apartments came through in 2019. The medical clinic came through in 2020. And the hotel came through in 2021. And so each of those, the, the panel gave comments that we as staff worked with the development team to make small changes and sometimes fairly significant changes to the development plan so that we get the kinds of uh, built outcomes that we want to see. So an example is like with the hotel. Initially, the hotel was, since it's tucked away in that southwest corner of the site, they were kind of turning their back on the rest of the development and really fronting out towards the interstate. Um, but the panel you know, said this is an opportunity for the hotel to reorient itself inwards towards the internal grid of streets and allow uh, visitors of the hotel to be able to exit straight out of the hotel into that network across the street or the apartments. They can easily access the green space that's been constructed, get to the mall easily. And so by just making some small changes in where the lobby was and where entry points into the building were, it really is going to make a dramatic difference of, of what the, the look and feel of this area as a place is going to be. Next slide. Yeah, so as I talked about uh, a second ago, the because of the property acquisition over time and also just based on uh, changes in tenants and, um, and new projects that have come incrementally to the site, the, the vision for the, the, the master plan vision for the site has changed over time. So starting in the upper left, you know, the idea has always been for there to be some multifamily here. I think initially just because of the economics, it was thought that it was going to be surface parked. Um, because Palladium was ever to do, able to do structured parking, it definitely took up less of a footprint and delivered much more of a the type of um, strong urban edge, um, you know, denser product that we like to see. Um, but but additionally, components like the location of a hotel or a potential grocer and other out uh, outlying buildings have has changed over time. Um, but but critical to the whole throughout the whole process has been maintaining that internal grid of streets and knowing that incrementally some of these parking lots are going to fill in. And then short term, what are some opportunities for using some of those parking fields that really aren't needed because there's so much parking that's here to be something that could be a community asset. And so maybe long term, there's opportunities for these to be soccer fields or other sorts of open spaces that residents and workers at, at Redbird can take advantage of, but also residents nearby who are visiting can take advantage of. So I guess next I'll turn it over to Kevin to wrap up and talk about some of the challenges. Thank you, Daniel and Travis. Uh, we're, we're recognizing we're a little over four, but so this is our last slide. Um, you know, this has been a difficult project um, and it continues to be. Things pop up all the time. It is true redevelopment, right? The, I guess the first two projects we heard about are 
Well, I guess Mike's got redevelopment going on um, too, but this is a little bit weird. Um, this site has like 40 feet of grade change from one side to the other because of the attempt at the time to have certain parking fields uh, allow people to enter on the first floor on one side of an anchor building on the second floor of the of a second adjacent side of the building. So this the sheer the the grade of the entire site has been a, a complicating factor. And how do you keep that walkable on an incremental block by block basis has been really tough. Um, we've got existing utilities that were probably fine in terms of capacity and condition, but had to be moved anyway to account for the fact that we were going to put a building, you know, across the parking lot. Um, and then we also had to keep, for those of you who've been dealing with malls, you know that the ring road is an easement and everybody on the inside and the outside has access to that uh, road through that easement. So during construction, you got to keep the ring road open at all times, which has also been a complicating factor. Um, and we couldn't move the road, so it's like a, a fixed thing and you got to work around it. Um, the loop trail is again part of what's going to make this project that build out really special, but it's not being built all at once. It's going to be built in little tiny segments as little vertical projects occur throughout the project. Um, you know, we've been working with DART to uh, uh, citywide as they've been redoing their entire bus network. Um, but the dark stops are important to this site, uh, given the demographics uh, uh, and the people that are be working and, and coming here for medical services and everything else. But the dark stops are way far away from the internal part of the site. Uh, so the, there are complications about how do you get people from where they get off the bus at the arterial road, you know, and they got to walk some in some cases uh, half mile to get to the, the front door of a building. Um, then there's zoning cha challenges as as Daniel said we this project did not go through a PD process. Um, it was originally regional retail and was rezoned in 2018 to go to MF2 which is a, a, a very basic zoning district but it allows multifamily uses um, and so we're not getting the the normal uh, design uh, stuff from the regulatory side that you would get in a PD. So everything we're doing is is a negotiation on the on the side of the incentive package. Uh, again, part of what's been challenging too is the sheer perception about the market it, down here. Uh, but the developer is is finding that there's there's an unmet demand for lots of these kinds of uses. Um, Financing has been weird uh, and it's the most complicating thing I've ever done in my life. There are 15 different senior loans on this site and we subordinate to every one of them as a subordinated uh, city loan lender to the project. Plus we have all these other financing tools that are weaved into some of the sites, but not all the sites. We have a, a lien deed of trust on some of the sites, but not all the sites. Um, so this has not been easy, but it's been quite rewarding for the city and for the community at large. Uh, and then nobody's mentioned COVID, so it must not be an issue for you guys in the suburbs, but this sure as hell has been a problem for us. Um, we've had to extend, you know, given as much time as we can to the developer, but um, you know, it's changed the game for the momentum that we thought we had on certain on certain things in attracting certain tenants um, and the velocity at which we thought things would be absorbed. So these are our list of challenges and I think we're, we'll stop and take any questions. Kevin, Daniel, thank you guys for telling the story of this. Uh, it sounds like a very complicated project. So um, let's see, I don't think we have any questions in the chat. I know we're a little bit over time here. Um, but it sounds like you, this project, you know, with the, the public incentive is really catalyzing, I guess, some market change to some extent. Would you guys say? 
Very, very definitely, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think really it good. extends it extends into the surrounding residential neighborhoods too. I definitely think it's it's changing perceptions in, in, in those areas too. Yeah, that's that's really cool to see. And if I understood correctly, y'all's um, urban design sort of capacity to comment on some of that infra street infrastructure was that part of the incentive package, correct? Or, or was that was kind of pulled with that? No, that's correct. We don't have any of the design features built into into the zoning, so um, it's through the urban design that's locked into the the development agreement. That's correct. Very cool to see those outcomes, though. Um, looking looking like some good stuff getting achieved with that. So, really appreciate you guys taking time to um, present all that and cover all that detail. Um, so, thank again, thank you to everyone who participated on the panel, um, Terrell, uh, Little Elm, for all that information. You guys, the city of Dallas, um, we're going to put these slides on our our website. So, you know, feel free to share with your colleagues and. If you got some inspiration from the the challenges that any of our communities went through um, to get where they're at with these projects uh, definitely take a look at this uh, so that really wraps up our, our panel on walkable places um, before we uh, log off i'm going to turn it back over to sean to share a quick announcement sean hi everybody so apologies all we ran a little bit long and we want to be respectful of your time so we are going to pass over our transportation alternatives call for projects announcement. However, it will be posted on the website with the rest of our presentations later today or first thing tomorrow morning. It includes a lot of detailed information for reference as well as contacts for questions if you have them. And also we have our transportation alternatives call for projects website, which I'm putting in the chat that has all that information uh, additionally. So uh, uh, yeah, so we will wrap it up um, and everybody uh, we have, if you have any thoughts on um, uh, the, present, the meeting today, uh, fill out our survey, evaluation survey that is also in the chat um, and review our walkable places map. We'll also send out these links with our follow up email for you. And then remember also that we do have a one and a half AICP CM credits available for attending to today's events. So if you want to do that, be sure to go and register your attendance. So thank you everybody for attending and we will see you next time.